morning, it's Crash Connell, and it is a fresh new podcast today, Friday, September 15th, 2023. Mary Danielson, back in the host chair. Good morning. A beautiful early fall day in the upper Midwest, or the great white north as we often call it. There's no snow yet, so we're happy about that. My guest today is Rebecca Kiesling, and I will introduce her to you in just a few minutes. We're going to hear her compelling story for the first half. Of, of the podcast, and then a few headlines for part two. My scripture this morning is Ephesians 1, 3 to 6, which says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Boy, that's rich, isn't it? Why not you pray with me this morning? Oh, Lord, thank you for such incredible promises. I'm not sure we even comprehend some of that, um, but that it is your good pleasure to adopt us and make us holy and blame us, blameless and grant us abundant spiritual blessings as well as eternity with you. We ask, Lord, that you walk among us today, comforting and encouraging as only you can. I pray for my guest today, Rebecca, and her powerful testimony, and ask that you continue to give her grace and opportunities to share what you have done in her life. Protect her and her family. We commit our day and our lives to you afresh, and we long to see you face-to-face above all. In Jesus' name, amen. Rebecca Kiesling has been an international pro-life speaker and adoption speaker since 1995, speaking for various pro-life organizations, including Right to Life groups, Crisis Pregnancy Center fundraisers, 40 Days for Life events, and then rallies, churches, high schools, universities, students for life, women's conferences, attorney conferences, adoption events, etc., all around America, uh, North America, Europe, and Latin America. Um, politically influential. Also, she changed the heart of Governor Rick Perry during his presidential campaign, as well as Newt Gingrich might get a chance to ask her about that. And many legislators across the U.S., Canada, Europe, and Latin America. She's helped pregnant rape victims, excuse me, she's helped pregnant rape victims all around the world to choose life for their children. She's an attorney and mother of five. Website, save the one, number one, save the one.com. Rebecca, welcome back to Stand Up for the Truth today. Thank you. It's just great to have you on. We appreciate your time. I want the listener uh, to get to hear your story. Uh, So just if you would dive right in with your childhood and the point at which really the entire focus of your life changed. Tell us a little bit about your story, Rebecca. Sure. Um, I was adopted and uh, raised in a secular Jewish household. Mm -hmm. And I um, wanted to meet my birth mother from, uh, you know, Basically, once I understood what adoption was and that I had a birth mother out there, at 18, I was told I would never get to meet her because of what the law was when I was placed for adoption. But I got my non-identifying information, and um, it said my biological father was Caucasian and of large build. Well, there were all kinds of details about my birth mother, and I thought, of course, that sounds like a police description. Mm. So I asked my caseworker, was my mom raped? And she said, yeah, I didn't want to tell you, and and I was just devastated. I instantly knew what people said about abortion and cases of rape. I felt targeted and devalued by our society, by the world. Um. You know, I had questions of, like, who am I? Why am I here? Mm -hmm. You know, what is my value, identity, and purpose? Mm -hmm. Um, My my parents weren't much help with it. My adoption story was parent-centered. It was centered on their infertility. Mm -hmm. So it's like there was no sort of worldview that said that, you know, God had a special plan for my life. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I met my birth mother. A year later, I I had a judge grant my petition to allow a caseworker to try to contact her to see if she wanted to meet me, and she did. But she told me the horrible details that she had been abducted at knife point by a serial rapist. Mm. Um, And and later, 
you know, I asked her, she was really happy to meet me, sent a beautiful letter, but I asked her about abortion and she told me if it had been legal, she 100% would have aborted me and actually tried it to illegal abortions. Mm. Wow, that's a heavy story. So your life started out in chaos. You said you were raised in a secular home and then you had, you said you were 18 when you went to look for your mom. How, where did the Lord fit in with all that? At what point did you start seeking the Lord? And how long did it actually take to find your birth mom? So, I even though my parents, like, never prayed at home, I mean, we they sent me to five years of Hebrew school, mm. three yeah. days a week. I was a bat mitzvah. So I grew up wow. hearing about God, hearing Bible stories um, from the Old Testament, um, and, and, you know, I learned, like, the prayers in Hebrew for, you know, the high holidays and, and you know, lighting the candles at Hanukkah. Mm-hmm. And, um, but, you know, God was completely irrelevant in our household. The one religious person in the family was my grandfather, and he was extremely abusive mm-hmm. um, to my grandmother. He beat her all the time, and she had to come to her home, and wow. my, my parents were abusive, um, so, you know, I would, I would talk to God, but my classmates told me that I was a bastard, I, I, that I'm not really one of them. And, you know, I never learned about Ruth from the Old Testament, how she mm-hmm. said, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. You know, and she was considered one of the heroes of the faith, even though she had been a Gentile. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, never heard any of that. So, like, I really didn't know where I fit into this world, and I thought by meeting my birth family that would help me, you know, find my roots. Like, I watched that miniseries Roots, yeah. Alex Haley's Roots. Yeah, I remember that. And, yeah, and I and so I thought that this would help ground me. Yeah. Um, I kind of felt like a puppet, like a marionette, mm-hmm. you know, all these people pulling strings on my life and... Oh. Wow. So I felt like the feather in, in the movie Forrest Gump, you know, <laughs> just haphazardly, like mm-hmm. getting knocked around. And, and you know, I, I really, as Scripture said, like built my house on sand. Sure. And um, like I kind of didn't know what that rock was, but I, I wanted to find a rock that would ground me. Yeah. Did someone take you to church, or how did that, How did you actually undertake that? Because it's totally different than, you know, coming to know the Lord is so different from wow, you had such an amazing um, start in life that, you know, you'd think, well, what what would cause you to seek the Lord? Um, it was an invite, okay. which there's actually studies that show, you know, if if people are invited to church, like, they would go. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, a huge percentage of people say, yeah, if I was invited, I'd go. Hmm. And... And that's what happened. So I was 15, and a girl from my high school gymnastics team invited me to hear a special youth speaker who laid out the message of the gospel. And I, I'd never heard this before. Mm. I mean, this was yeah. revolutionary for me. Yeah, I bet. Um, you know, like Jesus was not a popular subject in a Jewish yeah, household. Right. <laughs> and I, I mean, I thought, you know, I'd, I'd see like these images of of. Jesus, and I'd think, like, oh my goodness, they're violating, you know, the Ten Commandments, mm. the graven images, and, you know, worshiping a man, like, don't they know how bad that is, yeah, you know? Right. Um, nobody explained anything to me, and, I mean, you know, when it came to Santa Claus, like, I mean, I, we watched the movies, you know, sung all the songs, how, you know, he's this omniscient character who, you know, flies around the world, has these powers, he knows if you've been good or bad, and <laughs> and you've got this, um, you know, sort of all-knowing figure, and, and then you got this Christmas tree, and then next to that is palm trees with a baby that looks to be in a very uncomfortable cradle, and these animals, and then at Easter time, you've got... Um, you know, this Easter bunny who hops around with chocolate eggs and, 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 you know, and then this, this guy up on a cross bleeding. And I'm, I I couldn't imagine how it all fit together. And Mm -hmm. I just thought this is one weird religion, you know? (laughs) That's an interesting perspective because I never would have thought of it that way, having just been raised 
myself just Catholic. So all of that was just a second nature to me, um, even and, though I wasn't saved. And on top of it, on top of it, um, Santa didn't come to my house. Right. You know, and allegedly he went to all the houses of all the good little boys and girls around the world. But when I asked my parents why, they just said, well, it's because we're Jewish. So as far as I knew, like, yeah. Santa was an anti-Semite. Yeah, wow. Um, and the first time I ever stepped foot in church, it was, I was 12, and I was invited to Mass for Palm Sunday. And it was at like this monastery, and there were monks with the vow of silence. And I thought, wow, that's really creepy, kind of like in the movies. You know, like there are always creepy characters in the movies I'd seen. Mm-hmm. And um, when it came up time to have communion, um, I, I asked my friend, Francesca Frasciari, um, what's that? And she said, it's kind of like crackers and juice. So I stood up to, to get some, and she said, well, you can't have any. And I asked her, well, why not? And she said, because you're Jewish. And I thought, wow, it's true. You know, everything that my family taught me, you know, they really do hate the Jews. Like, they won't even let me have crackers and juice. Wow, wow. No wonder. I mean, Um, I can imagine. Go ahead. Go ahead, dear. Nobody ever shared their faith with me. Yeah. Wow, so you didn't even know why they believed what they believed, which is kind of sad, actually. But it's no wonder that finding your identity and and value and purpose became such an important thing to you, because if I were you at that point, I'd be completely confused, and I'm sure that you were. Uh, and then so at some point, the gospel resonated with you, right? Yeah, so she invited me here, the special youth speaker who laid out the message of the gospel. He actually went through Old Testament prophecy. Oh, okay. ironically, oh, and it was so compelling. Yeah. And then they did like the whole close your eyes, raise your hands. And I remember okay. my palms were sweaty and my <laughs> heart was beating on my chest. And, and I knew that this would be like an act of war yeah. in my family. Like I might as well have told them I joined the Nazi party. Wow. Um, it would be the greatest betrayal. And then they said, you know, actually come up and do a public display. display and I did. Wow. And I kept going to like youth events, like and, and going to church with their family and then after a while my parents like what's going on and they took me to see this rabbi who dipped me in water when I was three years old it's called the mikvah it's kind of like the Mm -hmm. baptism of John and he he explained it was a purifying thing when you adopt a a gentile child you know they have to be like purified and and how I was made Jewish I didn't have any choice about it and you are whatever your mother's religion is which is something I'd always heard which is so weird like I just has nothing to do with faith and my dad was like, that's right, tradition, you know, <laughs> like, started singing the songs from right. around the roof. Right, wow, um, that's great. So then yeah. bef- before you even found your birth mom, you were a believer then? Well, I fell away. Okay. So I, I was thrown into Bible studies, like adult Bible studies, where we're studying like signs of the times, and, I, and I'm like, who's Paul? You know, sure. I, I, I knew what I needed to know for salvation, but I, I kind of didn't know the whole cast of characters. And yeah. I wasn't given the milk that you're supposed to get as a baby Christian. Sure. Right, right. And wow. um, they would toilet paper the house whoever didn't show up that week in the youth group. And oh. I was like, please don't do it to my house. Oh, like, my goodness. I would stay in the car and I wouldn't participate. And I'd say, this is not fair to the parents. I'd say, it's okay. Um, they're Christians. They'll forgive us. And I, I wow. said, you know, please don't do it to mine because my parents are not Christians yeah. and they won't forgive you. Yeah. And I missed one time, like nine months later, and my dad was in his pajamas and chased them across a, you know, a couple of yards. Mm-hmm. And the girl turns around like, hi, it's me, Shelly, the girl who had led me to the Lord, like and been driving with her family. Um, and then like that Sunday, two days later, no phone call. Her parents didn't come and pick me up. When school started a month later, she wouldn't talk to me. Mm. And I felt just so betrayed. Mm. So, yeah, no doubt. um, I spent some of the toughest years of my life, you know, away from God, away from church, mm. just, you know, still believing, still knowing better, praying to God to get me out of whatever mess I got myself into. Yeah. Oh. But it was when I was in law school, I was beat up by a boyfriend from law school, um, ended up losing my front tooth. And again, someone else invited me back to church. Wow. Wow. What a story. What and a I gave story. my heart back to Christ. Yeah. Well, and now today you, you are just uh, 
firmly entrenched in the pro-life and the activism. Uh, what does it mean to be 100% pro-life, Rebecca? I mean, would you say that it's not not just one of, but probably the criteria that Christians could consider should consider regarding um, uh, voting for leaders and that sort of thing? It, what does it mean to be 100% pro-life? So actually, the the verse that my organization is based upon is is from the book of Matthew 18, the parable of the lost sheep. Um, in my, so my organization is Save the One. Mm-hmm. And because people would say, oh, you saved the 99 in exchange for the one. Mm. You know, they'll say it's like a burning building. Yeah. And and when I ever hear the 99 for the one, I think of the parable of the lost sheep. Jesus said, see that you do not despise any of these little ones, for I tell you, they're angels in heaven. Always look upon the face of my Father in heaven. And we are despised. Like my people groups despised. We're called yeah. evil seed, demon seed, horrible reminder, monstrous child, rapist child. We never get called mm-hmm. rape victim's child, always rapist child. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're systematically targeted, you know, for abortion and for annihilation. Um, we're, we're despised. And I, I'm called... Um, rape trophy, tainting the gene pool, you know, it's, it's horrible. And then, um, then Jesus goes straight into the parable of the lost sheep, how the good shepherd leaves the 99 to save the one. And he explains its point by saying, for in the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these mm-hmm. little ones should perish. Mm-hmm. And neither should we. In context, he was talking about the little ones who are despised, who are at risk of being killed. And in the modern world, that's my people group. Yes, most definitely. And I love your website, savetheone1.com. This is Standard for the Truth. I'm talking to Rebecca Kiesling of Save the One. And I love what your website says. There's so many great stories on here. Uh, I encourage people to pay a, pay a visit to it. But the mission is to educate everyone on why all pre-born children should be protected by law and accepted by society without exception and without compromise. Further, we wish to educate pro-life advocates, legislatures, leaders, and clergy on how to articulate a proper defense of children conceived in rape or incest, as well as those with special needs. Our purpose is to tell our stories and demonstrate the the value and dignity of our lives and take the discussion of the hard cases from concept to real life. And uh, I, I just think there's just a tremendous amount of value to the stories you have on the website. So I encourage people to go there. Well, and we don't have a lot of time left, just a couple minutes. Um, I know your focus probably has changed somewhat since Roe v. Wade was overturned federally. Um, maybe you can just give us some closing thoughts on that. Um, and we're, we're traveling hopefully on that, aren't we, right? Yeah, so just messaging, punish rapists, not babies, okay? Yeah. That's an easy response. I believe in yes. punishing rapists, not babies. Yes. You know, and that that's scriptural where we're told that um, you're you're not to punish the child for the sins of the father, each will be punished for his own sins. Mm-hmm. Um, it's barbaric in a civilized society. You don't punish innocent people for someone else's mm-hmm. crime. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court said rapists don't deserve the death penalty, Coker v. Georgia. And the second case, I'm a lawyer, so I'm going to go all legally. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in the second case of Kennedy v. Louisiana, they said that even for child molesters, it's cruel and unusual punishment. Wow. So how does an innocent child deserve to die for his crime? Wow. You know, and there's no due process whatsoever. A woman can just say rape, and that's it. The child gets sentenced to death. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine if that was the case for alleged rapists? Yeah. Like people would be like, whoa, 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 no, no right to trial. And even still, they don't get the death penalty. Mm-hmm. But the child has to die for his crime. Um, and the child is, is actually the evidence of the crime, especially when it comes to child molesters. Right. Um, we know that child molesters, sex traffickers love abortion. The abortion clinic's their best friend. They can't... Um, continue perpetrating without them. They protect and enable Mm. the traffickers and the child molesters. Mm. But the child's the one who reveals the rape, who delivers the girl out of that abusive household, Mm -hmm. where often her own mother is trafficking her or leaving her unprotected. Wow. Well, Rebecca, we are just so grateful for your testimony. And, and, you know, the fact that God uh, redeems us from the pit, you know, he redeems our lives uh, for eternity. And, um, what an incredible story that you have, um, just uh, starting in chaos. And, and you've continued to suffer 
hurts uh, and difficulties, but God has certainly shed his grace on your life. So Rebecca, thank you so much for your time. I hope to talk to you again uh, sometime in the future and we'll talk more pro-life. Thank you, dear. Thank you. All right. So I have coming up in the next segment, some headlines, you know, we got to squeak some of those in sometimes because there's so much going on in the world and I don't get a lot of chance to do that. We have so many great guests and you can go to standupforthetruth.com and you can look at our guest list, find your favorite, click on their name to find their recent podcasts. The link is guests at standupforthetruth.com. Again, uh, my name is Mary Danielson. You're listening to Stand Up For The Truth. Uh, Stay with us. We'll be back in a couple of minutes with some important headlines. Feedback, questions, and topic suggestions are always appreciated. Email us at comments at standupforthetruth.com. Welcome back to Stand Up For The Truth for this Friday. My name is Mary Danielson. And we are going to have some headlines uh, for the second half here. I've been hoping to squeeze some of these in at some point. Uh, I'm going to start with a, a Bible verse in this half, too. And it's, uh, uh, therefore, my beloved brethren. Oh, sorry. That's the one I end with. I, I got distracted. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And I want to draw your attention to the phrase, this is, and this is Second Peter 3, 11 to 14. I want to draw your attention to the phrase, what manner of persons? Now, if you do some digging, you're going to find that this phrase actually means what, citizens, what citizenship ought you to be? Remember, he says, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons, what citizenship ought you to be? Now, Peter talks about in First Peter being in submission to governing authorities. Um, he says, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good, for this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. So that's in First Peter. But now we're talking about a heavenly citizenship, and I love the comparison there. He's talking about outward conduct and inner godliness that results in knowing, knowing that our citizenship is in heaven. So there's a comparison. Uh, Peter's epistles are just loaded with practical teachings for these times. Some of my favorites go to uh, chapters these days. So I really encourage a study of those two books. So in the world, but not of it, right? Uh, One thing that came across my plate last night has to do with this UN summit that's coming up Monday and Tuesday. Um, it's the SDG Summit, Sustainable Development Goals. And we've talked about those on the air. You can easily look those up online to find out what they are. It's just their plan for equity um, and fairness in economics and in, in gender and every imaginable. This is their envisioning a new world. It's Agenda 2030. We heard of Agenda 2021. Well, we're past that. It's Agenda 2030. So they're meeting next week. The UN is Monday and Tuesday to talk about this. And it's they're touting this. And you can go on the UN site. They're touting this as a seven-year plan to initiate all of these goals. Well, that's very interesting because now the Saudis are co-hosting an event within that event aimed at the peace process. I find that very interesting because it's a seven-year plan, and now they're pulling the peace process into this. Very, very fascinating because a peace process uh, will take place. A covenant will take place um, between the Antichrist and and Middle East leaders and Israel to kick off the tribulation, so there will be this peace. And I'm, I'm presuming this is going to take some time, but the fact that it's even being introduced in this um, medium is very interesting. The event titled Peace Day Effort for Middle East Peace will take place on Monday and is being put on by Saudi Arabia along with the Arab League and the European Union in cooperation with Egypt and Jordan, one of the diplomats said. UN UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez will be the keynote speaker. Uh, Neither the Israeli nor Palestinian missions were invited to the event. Uh, The UN diplomat said, explaining that it's focused on congregating important global stakeholders on this issue in order to reinvigorate 
the peace process. So um, do your homework on that. Um, But it is the latest effort by Saudi Arabia to engage in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as it negotiates with U.S. President Joe Biden's administration about a potential normalization agreement with Israel. So, um, And then it says there will be follow-up conversations between the U.S., Israeli, Palestinian, and Saudi officials on the sidelines of the U.N. General Assembly next week. Riyadh will likely need a few months to study the issue further before raising specific demands in its talks with the Biden administration, according to two officials. So we've seen on a couple different fronts, they're really, really trying to get Saudi Arabia to um, uh, maybe be the one that's um, successful in bringing all parties to the table. And then there's uh, Netanyahu who says, we'll never have a a two-state solution. So this is going to be fascinating. Um, Keep an eye on that UN uh, summit, CONFAB, I call it, next week to see uh, what it is exactly they are um, promoting and doing and planning uh, for the future of the Middle East. So we also have uh, something here. We got a call uh, last week uh, from a listener at the station regarding the upcoming NEW Pride event. It's coming to the Brown County Fairgrounds also next week, September 22 and 23. Uh, well, these have been going on for quite a few years, and I know um, a lot of cities in the Valley have had these. Uh, I think we can agree the promotion of these activities and the content has gone up a notch from just uh, off and on during the year to f- a fairly constant. Now, this sister who called here, uh, she had made quite a few contacts in local government and expressed her disapproval for the event. In particular, and I know we all understand this, because it was being promoted as family-friendly and wondering just why we even have obscenity laws on the books if authorities aren't even willing to enforce them. And we did a a show on this kind of uh, program in Madison just a couple weeks ago, and uh, there was it was bad, and there were some probably obscenity laws broken, but I won't go into that. So I tip my hat to this gal, this sister, for expressing her dismay at this type of event. Um, I just want to look at one of the local articles on it, and I hope that parents would think twice about taking their kids to such an event. Just because it says family-friendly, of course, these days you have to really be vigilant about such things. And this is uh, NEW Pride event has admission critics, and this is WLUK. NEW Pride is hosting a weekend event at the Brown County Fairgrounds later this month, and it isn't sitting well with one state lawmaker. The two-day event features drag shows, including ones where people of all ages are welcome. Uh, It'll take place on September 22 and 23, and on Friday, you have to be at least 21 to attend. But on Saturday, all ages are welcome to come. I never thought I'd see such things in my life. But anyway, uh, Friday is obviously adults only, said Dawn Radford, who has attended the event in the past. It'll be more like a burlesque show. You've probably heard of burlesque and vaudeville. Um, burlesque was the adults, and vaudeville was all ages. The content of the drag shows should be nothing new. Um, And then this person compares it to uh, Three Stooges, which is just absurd to me. Um, But this representative, John Mako of Ledgeview, Wisconsin, says, I don't understand drag shows. It's not my cup of tea, but they have a right to be there. He has no problem with the NEW event. He believes the attendees must be 18. Fox 11 asked Mako if it's possible to have an event like this that is family-friendly and suitable for all ages, and he said, no, not likely. The whole concept and what they do and the fact that they're bringing children is very sexualized. There's no way to undo that. So that's coming up. I mean, if if you, uh, we can at least pray, right? And if you feel that you want to contact um, your legislators about such thing, uh, you certainly uh, should do that because... Um, we are absolutely living in a whole new world. I think we will all agree about that. Um, let's switch gears quite a bit here because there have been some disasters. I don't know if – I have not seen this on the news very much at all. But, again, there's a loss of life here. There are people that uh, are going into eternity, and uh, we can certainly pray for these families. Libya, um, terrible disaster there. They are going to top out at over 15,000 dead and 35,000 displaced due to flooding following a storm that was far from ordinary. And nothing is ordinary these days. I'm, I'm getting that. 
And this was called Storm Daniel. It was a very powerful typhoon. And what followed was catastrophic flooding. And then the unthinkable happened. Two huge critical dams broke, an upper dam, and then that led to a lower dam. And they broke just like dominoes. And this article here, this is Robert Malone wrote an article about Libya. Um, he says, I have been trying uh, to understand this flooding. The first wave of deaths was attributed to Storm Daniel. Um, and he has actually was on a boat. This is fascinating. He was on a boat in the Mediterranean, and they had, they had to get out. Uh, and he said, Libya tried to prepare because of the storm. They took precautionary measures, measures such as closing four oil ports on September 10th. The state-owned National Oil Corp declared a state of maximum alert in anticipation of possible hurricane making its way towards the country. And it came as a full force hurricane, and the people simply were not ready because the dams broke. They also weren't in very good condition. Um, it's just really a sad, sad tale. Libya is a failed state. If you remember the Arab Spring, um, I'm trying to remember what year that would have been. Um, I don't know, maybe 06, something like that. I did not check into that. But uh, the city of Derna, it took the most hit. And uh, these people were dependent on those dams for water. But uh, like I said, Libya has been a failed state since uh, we, quote unquote, we worked together to successfully overthrow Muammar Gaddafi. And a lot of a lot of nations over there have changed radically since the, quote unquote, Arab Spring. The four decade long de facto leadership of Gaddafi ended when he was killed in 2011 in a 2011 rebellion aided by Western military intervention, quote unquote, that includes the U.S., and the country was very destabilized and split into uh, Eastern and Western factions. So um, anyway, one quote here is, devastation is so deep, some areas have been vanished, completely disappeared. Imagine a residential area that has been destroyed completely. You cannot see it. It does not exist anymore. I've never seen anything like this. So pray for the people of Libya. Uh, at least 15,000 dead, and I know 10,000 are missing. So it's just a horrible event there. And also Morocco, um, that happened at the beginning of the Prophecy Conference. 6.8 magnitude disaster in Morocco. The Morocco earthquake killed thousands of people and devastated parts of Marrakesh and communities south of the major city. It sent people throughout the country rushing into the streets as buildings crumbled, creating an immense need for aid. About 3,000 have died, um, 5,500 injured. Like I said, it was a 6.8. They have not had a lot of strong earthquakes there, so this is not a common thing. Uh, in 1960, they had a 5.9 um, near Morocco's coastal region, but really no magnitudes of 6 or larger have been recorded there. So more birth pangs, more suffering. Um, and most of the children, families and children were home in bed at the time. It says uh, the earthquake was the result of oblique reverse faulting. Uh, as a professor of geodynamics at uh, the Grenada University said, this happens when tectonic plates collide, causing stress to build on a fault line. Um, so some, some quakes are, are a shift down between plates, so this is actually colliding. So very, very interesting. Um, we'll just have to continue, like I said, continue to pray for these people. A lot, of, a lot of lives lost. Some of these places will never be rebuilt. This town in Libya will never be the same. And so we do lift those people up to the Lord. Um, I like to read Jeff Childers, Coffee and COVID. What a great articles he has. Just fantastic um, substack every single day. And uh, Jeff's a believer. He is a, an attorney. And um, he just has just the right amount of a cynicism, I think, for our times to be able to um, communicate the insanity that's going on in our government. And as you know, um, the Republicans are going to pursue impeachment with uh, President Biden. And he says this, he says, yesterday, evidently just as tired as the rest of us of hearing there's no evidence for impeachment, the House Oversight Committee published an informative explainer on its website entitled Evidence of Joe Biden's Involvement in His Family's Influence Peddling Schemes. Okay. The new site doesn't offer any new revelations, but it's a good comprehensive list of 22 items of evidence just of the Biden bribery deals. I'd like to suggest the committee keep a standing list on its site and move things on or off as the case develops. 
He says, meanwhile, facing an existential threat to the Biden gravy train's integrity, Biden's handlers did not stay idle, even if Joe himself was sleeping. Yes, yesterday, CNN ran a story headlined, White House sends letter to news executives urging outlets to ramp up scrutiny of Biden impeachment inquiry based on lies. The article was deliciously ironic and possibly even a self-parody. The article's news was that the White House sent all major media, media executives a letter directing, and I mean, oh, I mean encouraging them to ignore the Republicans' baseless process story. The letter strongly advocated that the media has a responsibility to the truth, meaning a lie, <laughs> man, in the form of taking Biden's side against the Republicans. So do you, understanding this, he has told all the media outlets, I mean, this is just brazenly out in the open. I'm sure it happens more than we care to understand that the media needs to take his side on this because everything the Republicans are spewing is lies. He says, uh, Jeff Childers says, this is where it got hilarious. See how CNN repeatedly characterized the Republicans' impeachment inquiry as baseless, as if that were the fact. And note how they continually obscured the definition of evidence. And this is what CNN said. The White House sent a letter to top U.S. news executives on Wednesday, urging them to intensify their scrutiny of House Republicans after Speaker Kevin McCarthy launched an impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden, despite having found no evidence of a crime. Oh, my goodness. McCarthy launched the impeachment, impeachment inquiry Tuesday without a formal House vote in a bid to appease Republicans on his far right. House Republicans, most of whom have denied that disgraced Former President Trump committed any wrongdoing, have long sought to baselessly portray Biden as a corrupt, crime-ridden politician engaged in sinister activities. Baselessly. The Republican House-led investigations into Biden have yet to provide any direct evidence that the president financially benefited from Hunter Biden's career overseas. And Jeff says, ha-ha, that's establishment media even handed news reporting for you. And Hunter Biden's career overseas, what career? What, pray tell, was that career exactly? So basically news was the White House has enlisted the media onto its impeachment response team, and CNN is 100% on board. And, of course, that surprises absolutely no one. Um, he says the House Oversight Committee should send its own letter to the media executives enlist, listing the evidence and calling on them in the noble spirit of Watergate to hold the White House's muddy feet to the political fire. Yeah, indeed, that is not going to happen. But, uh, wow, talk about manipulation on steroids. Another really important story is Iran gets more than they could ever hope for. Biden has a secret illegal deal with Iran that gives mullahs everything they could ever want. In the latest phase of an unacknowledged and unlawful nuclear deal between the U.S. and Iran, President Joe Biden this week formally approved giving the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism another $6 billion, ostensibly for the release of five Americans held hostage in Tehran. But in bypassing Congress to avoid a political fight he knows he'd lose, He's not only guaranteeing more hostage-taking of citizens, American citizens, he's also subsidizing Iran's terrorism, their military support for Russia, nuclear weapons capabilities, and repression of Iranian women. Uh, in May, a top White House official of, uh, visited Oman to pass a message to Tehran. Washington wants to broker a nuclear deal in secret. Biden will lift sanctions Restrictions on Iranian funds held outside of its borders. So these are funds held by other countries. In exchange, Iran would slow its steady march towards a nuclear wep weapons threshold. The mullahs could keep providing armed drones to Putin for use against Iran. They could keep producing high-enriched iranium, just a, th a stone's throw from weapons grade. They could keep manufacturing advanced centrifuges, developing longer-range missiles, denying access to nuclear inspectors, and constructing a new underground facility that could prove invulnerable to military action. This is Biden's only demand. Don't move across the nuclear threshold by producing weapons-grade uranium and release those five American hostages. And, of course, this really, really is a dream come true for Khomeini. They give up nothing. Um, so they're just slowing down, you know, their stockpile of high enriched uranium. So uh, the hostages, it basically, if you break it down, it's $1.2 per person. 
And again, he can certainly restock his collection of American hostages for a future extortion racket. So it really is extortion. It's horrible. The article goes on a little bit. Um, you know, Congress shouldn't stand for this, it goes on to say. It's a flagrant abuse of power and evasion of the law. No surprises there. Um, also, there's Palestinian terrorizing, terror rising, or terrorizing, however you want to look at that. Um, Organized Palestinian terror is back to haunt Israeli civilians. This is Front Page Magazine. 2023 has been the most lethal year in terms of terror and casualties since 2005. Um, you know, it was, it was usually, uh, essentially, the terror in the past was committed by individual Palestinians, knifing, car ramming, that sort of thing. But this is much more organized. And so there's a central command of terrorists affiliated with Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and Mahmoud Abbas's Fatah. So um, Judea and Samaria are what they're after. And so they've really been challenged over there in Israel by a strategic turnaround in the way that they are uh, waging deadly actions there. And uh, they don't like Mahmoud Abbas. They think that a contributing factor is that he is becoming uh, just more impotent in leading them. And that's one of the things that they are uh, looking at ramping things up over there, so keep an eye on that. Um, I don't know how the Middle East holds together except by the hand of the Lord. So keep an eye on that. Uh, also, um, there's a lot more people ascending the Temple Mount, a lot more Jews, so we're in a very, very interesting season in the Middle East. Keep an eye on that. Syria is falling apart. That's a whole other subject. <sighs> you know, <laughs> And it's easy to just get bogged down by all of these things. I love to do the headlines. And then I tell you, it just it, it can be very wearying and tough on your soul. And I want to close this morning. I don't have much time or it's gone so fast. I like to look at, I'm switching gears here quite a bit, but I like to look at the history of hymns. I love to read the various history because people who wrote them are just like us. They may have lived in a different time and space and culture in some ways, their lives are just like us uh, with the struggles of, of day-to-day life. But in other ways, not at all. But Jesus is the same in all times and eras. And he touches hearts with his grace and wisdom. And he wishes that all men should be saved. And I want to I wanna close this morning with the history of the hymn, The Old Rugged Cross. In the north part of Reed City, Michigan, not far from where routes 10 and 131 merge, passing motorists will see a rough-hewn cross by the side of the road. It stands in front of the former home of hymn writer George Bennard, which has now been turned into the Old Rugged Cross Museum. Bennard's song was consistently named America's favorite gospel hymn in surveys between 1925 and 1960. Gospel singer George Beverly Shea tells a story about two men showing up at his family's home one Saturday when he was five. They'd be singing a new song in church the next day, and since Mrs. Shea played the piano, would she be willing to practice the song? the old rugged cross, with them. My parents would later tell how I stood by the piano with mouth wide open, listening to the voices of these wonderful singers, George relates. Few things in life came easily to Bernard. His father was a coal miner, and his parents moved frequently. As a teenager, Bernard felt called to be an evangelist, but when his father died suddenly, George had to support his mother and sisters. After marrying, he finally became a preacher, first with the Salvation Army, and later with the Methodist Episcopal Church. On one occasion, after a difficult season of ministry, George realized he needed to better understand the power of the cross of Christ. He later said, I was praying for a full understanding of the cross. I read, I studied, I prayed. The Christ of the cross became more than just a symbol. It was like seeing John 3.16 leave the printed page, take form, and act out the meaning of redemption. I was able to walk through that meaning. While watching the scene with my mind's eye, the theme of the song came to me. He goes on to say, It took several months for the words to formulate in his mind. As he preached throughout the Midwest, George would carry the words with him, working on them, polishing them, and sometimes singing them in his meetings. It always struck a chord with his audiences. At last, his hymn finished, George went on to the home of his friends, the Reverend and Mrs. L. O. Boswick, and sang it for them. After the last note, he looked at them and asked, Will it do? 
The Boswicks were so moved that they helped pay the fees to have it printed, and it began, began, began appearing in hymn books across America. The Old Rugged Cross, which starts out, On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it some day for a crown. And there are three more verses. And, uh, you know, like I said, I love these stories because these people's lives, um, have, they've changed a lot of our lives, actually, and given us a song to sing. And I'm just so grateful. And there are books out there with the history of hymns, and I, I really encourage you to look into those if you just really want to be edified. So thank you for joining me. We were only able to cover a few headlines today. There's so much more going on. Um, and as time allows in the weeks that uh, ahead, I hope to really keep an eye on a lot of these things for you because I know how difficult it is to do all that on your own. So um, thank you for joining me today. Uh, again, we have we have Andy Woods next week. We have um, um, J.B. Hickson is next week. And uh, drawing a little bit of a blank on the other one, but I'm looking forward to all that. So therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Thank you for joining me. Have a great day on purpose.